at least once a week, I get this look and followed by, why are you here? Sort of <laughs> some ver how did you get here? Uh, and, and at least once a week, someone in some context asked me. And, and so I've, I, this is my way of explaining where, where I am. And so I, I, I've lived at the intersection of five worlds. That's what I do. So the first world is medicine. The second world is science. The third world is public policy. The fourth world is management. And the fifth world is higher ed. And I'm right there. <laughs> that's space. That's, what I, that's where I am. And at various points in my career, I've been a, see, it, I wasn't planning on this grid in the back. It makes it more complicated. But, but at various points in time, I've, I've been at various parts of this. But this is where I exist. And, and, and it's been a good ride so far. I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, I grew up in uh, Baltimore. I was one of five kids. And my early life experience was deeply affected by family narratives. There's actually research about this now, about resilience in kids and how family narratives influence kids. And it had a huge influence on me. And if there were two things that came through in my early life, it was education, the value of education, and persistence. Uh, and, and I have some examples here. These are, are photos that I used to have actually on my desk here at, at, when I was a fellow here because they were so meaningful to me. These are family photos. And to the left is a photo of the 1903 Fisk University football team. And this is my grandfather there, uh, who was probably the last jock in the family. Uh, um, um, but but he, he and my mother's mother and father were both the first, uh, were the children of slaves. So all four of my, grandparent, my mother's grandparents were born as slaves. And both of them were the first in their families to go to college. And be, they became school teachers. And if there's one thing I heard over and over again, this was from a 1911 family gathering in front of the schoolhouse in their community. They, she grew up in this school, a community of freed slaves in Texas that still exists. And to the left are my grandparents. They both taught at this school at some point with four of their first kids. And to the right are my grandfather's parents and two of the, their siblings, all of whom were born as slaves. And, and this message that I heard over and over again was, Higher education allowed the family to move from slavery to the middle class in one generation. And I heard that over and over and over again. Everything depended on the power of higher education. So I may have overlearned that, <laughs> but I did hear it. My father, on the other hand, was an immigrant. Jamaican, um, came through Ellis Island. And I, and I recently found two interesting documents, family documents, on the Ellis Island webpage. So if you go and search Kington on the webpage, there are two families. Uh, family from Jamaica and a family from England. And um, this is a, 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 a ship manifest from 1923. Pass passengers is crossed out, and above it is the word stowaways. <laughs> um, and if you look to the right here, left here, Enos Kington, age 30, with deported stamped right there. He was deported. He came as a stowaway. Uh, on a, and, but being the persistent man that he was, he was put back on the ship, and the ship went back to Jamaica. And by the time he got back to Jamaica, he had convinced uh, the ship to hire him as a seaman. And they turn around, and he comes right back. <laughs> and, and now he appears on a different list, this one labeled deserting seaman. <laughs> um, Enos Kington, age 30, British. He figured out that the minute the ship stops, they would stop before they got to Ellis Island. When it stops, get off. Uh, and he just walked off and, and disappeared. He eventually became legal. Um, but my, my father, as an infant, came through Ellis Island. It was actually one of the few living groups, of, a smaller and smaller group of people who came through Ellis Island prior to the immigration restrictions in 1925. So he's 90 years old. Um, persistence was a message that came through clearly um, in my family. But there are other issues. I mean, I also had great luck to have wonderful parents, um, Mildred Kington and Garfield Kington. It's my mother, uh, early in her life, um, as, and my father with his NYU graduation photo in the 40s. Um, and, and this is them in their 80s, 50-something years later. Um, they, they were deeply committed to, to service and community. And my mother, school teacher, then after having five kids, sort of became more involved in community projects. And, this, and, and one of her key points was, you have no ability, no right to complain about anything in society if you don't engage in trying to fix the problem. And she, she would tell us that as kids, you can't complain about anything unless you sort of start volunteering and preparing to address the problem. My father practiced 
45 years, six days a week, in a solo practice on the first floor of a row house in the poorest neighborhood of Baltimore. He didn't even have a billing system. He thought billing was sort of unbecoming. Uh, um, and um, so, but, but deep service commitment to, to, and I learned from both of them. So I will give them credit uh, for, for giving me tremendous opportunities. They also told me there was a big world out there. I grew up in Baltimore, and Baltimore was a sleepy southern town when I grew up. And, and there was one place in the whole city where you could get the Sunday New York Times. It was the Penn Station. So every Sunday, the first thing that happened in the family, was whatever kid was up, went with my father down to Penn Station to get the Sunday New York Times and to have it go through the family. He subscribed to science in the 60s and 50s. And I remember a report I had to make on STDs in junior high. And he pulled out in the latest issue of science and said there was an article about syphilis, <laughs> you know? And, and, I, uh, and, uh, and, and so they, they, they really encouraged me to think in all sorts of ways and, and, and to, to have a huge sense of opportunity. And they somehow let me believe that I could do whatever I wanted to do if I worked hard. Um, and and, and I, owe them for, I owe them for that. I also grew up at the tail end of segregation. Um, I was in elementary school 10 years after Brown versus Board of Education, but Baltimore was a highly segregated community. And so I went to PS21. And the great thing about the school was that the teachers there really knew that our generation was going to be the first generation that walked through lots of doors. I mean, and, and they treated us as if we were like the crown jewels. I mean, really. And I remembered something recently. This is a school, and, and this happened right over here in this office. Um, the, the vice principal was named Mrs. Gearhart. And, 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 one, and I was a great student. I was. I mean, I was a really good student. <laughs> and, um, and one day, the teacher told me, Mrs. Gearhart has invited you, wants you to come down to her office. And I thought, oh, this is a problem, <laughs> because she only sees problem students. Um, so I went down, sat on the bench in front of her office, and then she called me in and she said, um, young man, I was looking over report cards and I'm mailing out and to your parents, and I see that you have all A's. And I thought, okay, I'm going to get stroked. Um, this is going to be great. And she said, but, but for one grade, handwriting has a B minus. That, that B minus ruins all of those A's. It destroys all of those A's. So, so what are you going to do about that B minus? I mean, think about it. This was a, and 45 years later, I remember this conversation as if it was yesterday. Uh, because it, it sort of taught me this, that her expectation was that I was to do as well as I could possibly do, period, full stop. And she thought I'd, I was capable of having straight A's, not straight A's, and one B minus. Um, and that message came through in all sorts of ways, and it pushed me to excel. Um, I then went to a public high school, Baltimore Polytechnic Institute, a very accomplished school, built, founded in the 1800s, all boys up until the time I went there. Um, very competitive school, um, started getting competition for the first time, and I also had my first failure. And I really believe that my entire academic career is due to this failure. Um, I took the first math course and got a 50 on the exam on the algebra exam. I had never failed anything in my life. I came home weeping. I mean, I literally was crying. And, um, and my parents again sort of said, okay, we're gonna like fix this. You know, workbooks, and, and I somehow figured out that the teacher didn't want me to succeed. Um, and I was determined to prove him wrong. And for the rest of my time there, I was either number one or number two in my track for the entire time I was there. I was determined to prove that I could succeed and, and my parents obviously expected me to succeed, um, but it made a difference, and it's sort of it really my entire academic career, I think if I had gotten a B on that exam, I would have had to deal with my parents who expected A's, um, but, but the internal motivation to really push myself to excel, um, um, I, I really do believe began with this failure. So I tell students a lot that, you know, failure can be a great thing. It may not feel so great <laughs> when you're failing, um, but it can be a great thing. And, and, and I left early for college, probably because the school was designed to produce engineers and I didn't want to become an engineer, as my three brothers did. And, and so I, I left early, went to Michigan, had a great experience. I, I um, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Initially thought that I, that I would never become a physician like my father because I got so tired of people asking me if I was going to become a physician like my father. Um, just constantly. And I, I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. 
was going to be an architect, heard that Michigan had a great, got the list of top schools in architecture, wrote them, got information from Michigan, and there was a box on Michigan that application said, do you want to be considered for the six-year pre-med medical program? And I literally checked the box on a whim um, and ultimately decided I wanted to get into that program and got in. Uh, there were 10 slots. It was basically a medical school within a medical school, and there were only 10 slots that allowed not out of people outside of Michigan to get into that program. So it was incredibly competitive. And, and I got in, and it was a wonderful experience. We had sort of a medical school within a medical school. We had uh, our separate classes. It, it, it was important for me for lots of reasons. I, one, I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to practice medicine. I, I knew that I was never going to practice medicine. Um, and I'll get back to what my thinking was there. Um, the first two summers I spent on Capitol Hill. I got an internship at a congressman's office and one in a senator's office because I was really interested in public policy. And that really just crystallized this my thinking about, oh, there's a way that, the, there's a big picture out there, and, and I can contribute to this discussion, and that was wonderful. And in my mind, because I had skipped so many grades, I thought, you know, I have four years to play with. You know, I would finished my school four years early. So I thought I had time, again, to allow myself the license to go wherever my mind led me. Um, so, I, so that was a, a great thing. So, did residency, and I'm back there. And Jordan Cohn is right there. And here's someone in the audience right here. Lynn, there you are. <laughs> a classmate uh, uh, in residency. Uh, a wonderful experience in Chicago. Most, and, and one of the reasons is because of Jordan Cohn, who, who continues to be a, a great uh, mentor and friend and colleague. Um, he was wonderful because, one, uh, knowing that I didn't want to practice medicine, I wasn't going to practice medicine, it was hard t doing a hard residency. It was a hard residency. Um, and, and I kept thinking, well, why am I doing this? <laughs> you know? and, and Jordan was the one who said, well, you know, you might be able to, if you get bored, you can get a faculty appointment in medical school. You, you should keep on. And, and I stayed on. He also allowed me to do an internship for a month in the senior year in Washington with the American College of Physicians digging into a policy issue um, with John Ball, who's the executive director in MDJD. And it's sort of, it, it, he just had an open mind, and he supported me to do non-traditional things, and, that was, and he's continued to be a great mentor. He went on to become dean at Stony Brook and then the president of the Association of American Medical Colleges, and I still stay in touch with him, and he's had a tremendous influence. Then I came to Penn. Um, I saw an ad in the New England Journal for the Clinical Scholars Program, and, and, and that's when I met Sam. Changed my life. So... I, I got the material, and I still wonder how I did some of this stuff. I had the guts to do some of this stuff. But um, I, I saw a list of who had come through the various programs, and I noted that the programs were highly inbred, that, that a lot of the people came from a small number of schools and residency programs, often associated with that institution. And I, was, I couldn't find a single person from Chicago there were some I later, but there were, I, I mean, Chicago is a big city with lots of residencies, and, and I, I thought, this is interesting. And so I wrote my essay, and, and I just didn't know what to write. And I thought, if for some reason I called his office, and his secretary, Audrey, answered the phone. I mean, some of you know Audrey, knew Audrey. And, um, and I said, listen, you know, I'm, I'm not in this network, um, and I don't know what to write for my essay. Would Dr. Martin <coughs> review my essay? And she said, sure. <laughs> I mean, and so I sent her, mailed my essay, draft essay to Sam. We set up a time. Sam went line by line by line and edited my essay. I said, oh, you, might, you maybe shouldn't say that, or maybe you want to think about saying that. And, you know, that's going to be read in a particular way. And he literally went line by line by line. Apparently, no one had ever asked him to do this before. <laughs> um, and he was the type who he would do it for anyone. Um, and, 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 he helped me. Did you ask him? He wrote it. <laughs> and, and you were from within the system. See, this is the old boys network again. So I just tapped into that network, my own little tab. Um, and then I came to interview, and, and an interesting thing happened. He interviewed me, and he said, um, as an aside, he said, you know, I've trained a fair number of African American leaders, science leaders, and in medicine, and it's always disappointed me that so few have gone back to their communities to serve. And he just, that just hit a button for me. And I immediately said, wait a minute, that's a double standard. When, have you ever asked a, a white fellow 
to go back and serve in his community? What are you talking about? And I just let him have it uh, in a way that was really probably not smart. <laughs> but the great thing about Sam was Sam, he paused and he said, you may be right, and moved on to the next thing. I'm convinced I was selected because I pushed back and, and he respected sort of people who didn't think, who weren't afraid to sort of push back. And, and it made a huge difference in my life. Um, started the MBA program, decided I was interested in policy, had the great fortune uh, to work with Patricia, and, and the topic was uh, liability, medical liability, and you know, I wasn't in love with medical liability, uh, but, but I wanted to work with Patricia. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. The, 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 most, the cleanest thinker I've ever worked with, by, by far. And, and I wanted to sort of see sort of how her mind worked. <laughs> and hope that a little of it might spill over in my direction and, and help me learn to think clearly. And it was a great experience. Um, I got a NARSA award. To, uh, first, it was two years of clinical scholars and two years of NARSA award. Um, actually, it was the first year that they allowed health services researchers to receive this training award geared toward biomedical research. I was very proud of the fact that I was number one. My application was ranked number one in the study section. I became famous in that little world. <laughs> Uh, because I was the first one funded under this uh, opening up, to, and, and a lot of people helped um, prepare, helped me with the fellowship, uh, preparing the application, including, um, who's the medical sociologist? Renee. Renee. Um, Renee, I, I gave a copy of my essay, <laughs> my application to her, and she called me into her office, sat me down, and said, you know, you need to, you need to learn how to write. <laughs> I mean, she was just very direct. She said, you need to learn how to write. Um, it, you know, after I sort of picked my ego up off the floor, I, it, she was absolutely right, and I did. I started taking at, uh, courses in the pen extension writing, and would after, after class, after school, would, after the day, would come back and teach and take writing courses, um, intro writing courses, because I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to write better. And it was a hugely uh, important skill. Um, I decided I want, was interested in geriatric medicine, lots of people I admired, Risa, uh, uh, Jerry Johnson, lots of people were in the field, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. Right, let me do this, and I, and I did another year in geriatric medicine. So what was I thinking up to this point? One, I thought I had an aptitude in science and math. I was okay in science and math, and that was something I thought, you know. I, one thing I've been very good about is understanding my strengths and my weaknesses, and I saw this as a strength. The reason I did medicine is because I was interested in understanding the human experience. And I know that may seem ridiculous, but it, it was important for me. I thought, you know, a lot of life's action occurs in Ill, with illness and a death and a birth and all these things where doctors, all these places where they're doctors. And, and I think it will be interesting to get exposure to the human experience by, by uh, getting my medical degree. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like saying, oh, I want a teacher certificate so I can teach just in case. Well, I, I did that with medicine. I thought, well, you know, I'll get my MD just in case, you know, and, and, and I convinced myself that I could do it, and that was important. I thought economics was interesting. I took my first economics course in the MBA program, had never had any economics before, and, and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. This seems to, like, make sense, it, 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 and perhaps most importantly, it's, it, it really is a good skill in, if I want to affect the world, um, particularly with regard to what was happening at societal level. I thought geriatrics was a great place because it sort of allowed inter intersection of social sciences and behavioral sciences with medicine. So I thought, okay, if I'm going to bridge this world of traditional biomedical approach and a social sciences approach, this is a great place to be. But I, but I also thought I might, interest, might at some point want to be a public health commissioner. And I'm not sure why I thought that. <laughs> but I thought, well, maybe if, you know, if I decide I don't want to do academics, so what I, two summers, I went to Hopkins and, in their short courses in epidemiology and took a whole series of epidemiology courses. And at the time, there was an alternative pathway for board certification in public health and preventive medicine if you were already boarded in medicine or peds. So I actually ended up um, getting board certified in public health because some commissioner positions required board certification. So that was sort of another fallback. As you can see, I had to... I, risk, risk averse in some ways. <laughs> I thought, right, well, that's another fallback that will help me just in case if I decide that's the way I want to go. And a number of clinical scholars, um, um, Reed Tux, and a whole series of folks had gone into public health, and, and I admired them. So I thought, maybe that's somewhere I'll end up. I went from there um, and, and went to RAND and UCLA. I was a senior scientist at the RAND Corporation 
and a professor in the uh, Department of Internal Medicine at UCLA. Rand was an extraordinary place for me. It, was, it changed my life again. I, get, I just kept getting lucky. Um, that's a photo of the old building in Rand. That was two blocks from the Santa Monica Beach, um, which added to the quality of work life um, <laughs> considerably. This is the new Rand. And, and two people really had a huge influence on me. Uh, Bob Brook, uh, sort of some consider the father of health quality um, studies. And Jim Smith, an economist, a labor economist, who you would, might not think, <laughs> why, why was he working with him? Um, and I'll explain how we ended up working together. And, and have continued to sort of uh, stay in touch ever since. But those two people really, Ram was just an extraordinary place um, because they thought big thoughts. They, they actually liked huge ideas. They wanted people who were, had sort of an entrepreneurial sort of inclination and who had big ideas and wanted to change the world. So Ram was a great place for me and, and I loved it. And I did lots of interesting things there. Um, um, and, and, and I thought I'd pause at this point to, to talk a little bit about my scholarship trajectory. And again, for, for, for better or worse, I, I sort of decided that I would only do what I thought was interesting. <laughs> you know? uh, and usually I was able to do that. Um, um, but but that, some people thought that was pretty audacious to think that I could do that. <laughs> I paid a price for it, but I'll get back to that. Um, so, so I was doing work in health services research in elderly populations in particular, looking at insurance and expenditure patterns, some work on effectiveness of various geriatric clinical services, um, long-term care, sort of uh, determinants of use of long-term care, and particularly um, differences in different subgroups, uh, demographic groups, and healthcare utilization, everything from dental services to sort of home care work. So, so I was sort of going down a very traditional health services research path, track and, and started doing a little bit more sort of public healthy things related to aging. So I did a paper on sort of determinants of driving patterns and, and all sorts of things I just thought were, were interesting. And, and, uh, but over the course of this uh, trajectory of research, it began to occur to me that the huge differences in determining whether someone lived or died were happening before healthcare ever entered the picture. That, and, and sort of, I, mean, I sort of thought there was more health, more action in health than in health care. Um, um, I thought health care was important for policy and for lots of reasons, but if you really wanted to shift the whole population, you needed to get at this health part. Um, and for me, I, I just decided that I was going to start moving in that direction. And that's a big shift uh, in, in direction in lots of ways. And then something happened. And this is a good example of life being, uh, a trajectory being completely changed by things completely outside of your control. The LA riots happened. Um, I actually was stuck in, in the midst of looting in my car that the night of the first, um, um, I was incredibly stupid. Uh, um, and, and all of my survival skills from growing up in a big city went out the window for some reason, and came very close. To, I mean, a, a brick came and broke my, the mirror on my car. And it, it would, would, if I hadn't decided, a friend of mine, I was having dinner with a friend, and she said, you know, back during the Watts riots, the rule was never stop at a red light. Um, and I was at a red light, and I remember, and I literally hit the gas as the brick was coming um, and, and, and dodged what would have been potentially a really serious thing. But, it prompted a group of minority researchers at RAND to get together. And we got together, it was a small group, uh, and got together and said, you know, here we are, we're like one of the world's leading think tanks, and all hell is breaking loose five miles away from us, and we are doing nothing to try to understand what, what happened. Um, so we just decided that what, if the next time one of us had a funding opportunity, we were going to take advantage of it, and we were going to do something even though none of us were really like community-based research people, not one of us. But we just said, you know what, we're, this is ridiculous. We, you know, we need to get into, into this game of understanding at least some of what's happening uh, in this area that's facing incredible challenges. So uh, there was an RFP um, uh, from uh, the National Institute on Aging for funding of, of, of research, exploratory research centers on minority aging. I knew nothing about minority aging. I really 
was not in any way um, in this area of specialty. But um, in a very short period of time, I convinced Walter Allen, who was a sociologist at UCLA, to be the PI. And I pulled together four groups, ran allocated money. RAM was great because you apply for a budget, and you got a line item for someone to prepare your budget for you, and a line item for someone to edit for you. And, sort of, and, and I got basically a $25,000 grant to get all these services within RAM to prepare this application. And we were writing up until the last minute. We literally had a system at RAM where you delivered the hard copies to the airport. They got on a plane, another person picked them up in Washington and delivered them to NIH. I mean, we were that close. Um, <laughs> And I personally drove the box to LAX. And we got funding, which was incredible. So, and again, I, had, I don't know what led me to believe that I was prepared to run this center. Walter, to his credit, said, you know, I'm not going to run this. You know, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be a PI, but I'm not going to run this. So I agreed to run it. And it was an incredibly difficult and, uh, and really time-consuming, but exhilarating in lots of ways. I mean, in a typical day, I might see patients at UCLA, go to South Central and meet at a community center where we're trying to recruit patients for a study, and then go to Rand in Santa Monica and have a meeting with econometricians about specification of an equation. I mean, literally within a day, I could go to those three different sites, and I was running around like crazy. It, and it had, there were consequences. And people, I knew about this. My, my publications lagged um, because I had this center. Um, and, and I, it became clear that I was not going to fit in the, the medicine tenure box at UCLA. And, um, and that's a generous way of describing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, and, and so it was, and it was also clear that, that I was going to have a tenure fight. And it started. Um, and, and senior people kept saying, no, don't worry. You're going to get through this. We have ways. We have ways. This is going to work. And I didn't see how it was going to work. <laughs> I just wasn't buying that. Um, so I began to rethink my career in lots of ways. And I started to think about what I really was interested in. And I really started to think that I was really interested in how social factors uh, have an impact on health. And Jim, Jim Smith, uh, was a labor economist, but there was um, someone who at, at RAND who was putting together a, a report by the National Academy of Sciences on, on aging and lots of dimensions of aging and behavioral and social factors. And she was great. She just called us both in and said, you're going to write a chapter. <laughs> so we haven't worked together, but you're going to write a chapter. You're going to write a chapter on social factors in aging and racial and ethnic differences. So go write the chapter. <laughs> um, and we had never worked together. Um, but it became, it was a great experience because Jim had a reputation for being terrifying. I mean, I mean he was just known for being no BS, I mean, really smart, and he didn't let anyone get away with anything. Um, and we hit it off. Um, so we started doing work on, on income and wealth and health status, sort of different components of income and income versus wealth and how to the extent to which large group differences might be explained by wealth versus income. And it was, it was fascinating. It was really interesting stuff. I started to get more and more in, into understanding sort of racial and ethnic differences in health. And then there were things that just sort of interested me. So I, we were analyzing data from the panel survey income dynamics a big survey, Michigan, we had done a, a supplement to it. And I saw that there was a question asked um, about reproductive history uh, for older women. And I thought, this is interesting. You know, and I ended up going and spending days reviewing the literature related to sort of reproduction and women's health. Sort of there's a whole theory of maternal depletion. Uh, um, there's, there's a whole literature about this, about how uh, the, what happens during reproduction can have an effect on the mother's health in various ways. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I did a study that looked to see whether or not um, events that happen during the, a woman's reproductive years, um, uh, birth before age 18, an infant death, uh, um, um, a low birth weight delivery, predicted health in later life. Wouldn't it be interesting if you could do that? You could see, because it, it might be a great marker for the conditions of the circumstances of that woman when she was reproducing. That might be really interesting. So I thought it was damn clever uh, and interesting. And I got it published, never heard from again. I mean, no one ever went anywhere with this. And I thought it was really, really interesting. So I, I had a remarkable ability to write these papers that, that would get published uh, but would go nowhere uh, um, because I had diverse interests. And I, and I would say, oh, OK, so I've started that. I'm going to move on to the next thing. 
And some got picked up and some didn't. I started looking in the same data set. I was reading about the Great Migration from the South, this huge, the largest population shift in the history of this country. I think five million African Americans moved them between 1920 and 70 from the South to the North. It had all sorts of implications for society. And not many people had looked at health. So we, we were able to disentangle sort of who was whites and blacks who were born in the South, born in, uh, born in the North, moved south, moved North from the South, and those who stayed. And so we ended up doing a, a study that was a really interesting study um, that was the first study that looked at health-related quality of life and found a very different, more, all the mortality data suggested that migrants from the South, particularly black migrants from the South, had higher mortality rates. But it turned out they had better self-rated health. So again, really interesting and all sorts of potential explanations for this. But, but I started asking these questions about how huge social factors translate into health. And um, I started getting also interested in the health of African American immigrants, which was becoming a larger and larger population of the, and again, this is a long way from where I started, but that's sort of where my mind led. And, and I decided to leave UCLA and ran. It was the best decision I ever made in my life. Um, it was no day at the beach, incidentally. Uh, it was not fun. Um, but I sort of decided that I needed to regroup. Um, that that the, particularly the tenure system in medicine didn't know what to do with me. Yeah. And, and I started also realizing that what I did well was connect across worlds and disciplines. And there was no box for connectors. Um, and connectors don't have the same research trajectory of, of if, you, you know, if you study the left kidney. Um, it's a different type of trajectory. And they had no way of acknowledging what I was doing, and they admitted that. Rand, on the other hand, was great. Rand said, right, you'll come work for us, we'll give you a center, and we'll give you a raise. Wonderful. Um, but I decided that I needed to sort of change direction, and it was a smart thing. Um, I also decided I, I needed to stop clinical practice. I was 10 years out from residency. I just didn't buy this game that you could continue to be a really good physician working a half day a week and attending six weeks a year in the internal medicine inpatient unit. I just didn't buy it. I still don't buy it. Um, for me, it, I, I didn't think it was smart. So I said, it was, knowing when to stop is important. I'm going to stop clinical practice. And I decided that I was really going to focus on biologic pathways, so, connecting social factors and health. And I happened to stumble upon an advertisement for a job at the CDC as a research scientist at, for the NHANES study. In Hades had all of this biologic data, they had social data. I thought, I can write papers forever related to trying to understand. They had longitudinal mortality data. I can look, really begin to disentangle some of the pathways connecting economic status with health. And, um, and there was an ad for research scientists. And I sent my information, and I didn't, get a, he didn't hear anything for a month. So I called up the, the, the person who was hiring. I said, you know, I sent my information. What, what was the problem? And she said, you know, we didn't think you were serious. We just didn't think you were serious about coming here. I mean, she, she just didn't believe that. So I paid for myself to go to Washington to interview at the National Center for Health Statistics. And I was hired. And it was and, and at a substantial pay cut. I think I had a 20% pay cut uh, coming there. And I just said, you know, I'm going to retool, and I'm going to take this chance. And it was really smart, if I should say so myself. Um, <laughs> in Haynes was a great study, an incredible study. Um, and if you don't, it's, a system of, it's the only probability sample, really, with biologic data of the entire United States. So you have teams of doctors and dentists and people who literally travel around the country after people knock on doors within uh, census tracts and, and get people to actually come interview for four hours and then get these very intense examinations with everything imaginable. It, it was the, we, it, the study had the only, and we had the first uh, truly representative genetic sample of data of, of, of the United States. It still is the only probability sample of genetic material of the entire country. Um, so really interesting stuff. Everything from, you know, they, did, they do the growth charts in every pediatrician's office. The growth charts come from the study. We did DEXA scans. I mean, everything imaginable. It was, it was wonderful for me because I had all these interests. And, and, and there were endless ways for me to sort of study um, this data set. And um, then an interesting thing happened. Um, well, one, I decided that, that I was going to start shifting my research as I took on more leadership roles. A year after I got there, I became my boss's boss. I was hired to direct the study a year after I showed up. Wouldn't have guessed that. In the long story how it happened, 
Um, I was in the right place at the right time, and I was willing to do it, and it was, it was incredible. I mean, my first real effort running a huge scientific enterprise, about 25 million a year, and we had 100 folks working for us, another 100 in contractors. It was a huge enterprise for me. Um, but I decided that I was going to start shifting my research as I took on more administrative roles. And, and I decided that I was not going to do something that a lot of people do. And that was I was not going to add my name to papers where I didn't have a really, really extensive engagement. Um, and, and there were people who told me that was a major mistake. Because, you know, in Haines, our, interim, our own unit cranked out papers. I mean, scores of papers. And I could have easily sort of added my name on many of those papers. And I just had a problem with that. Um, so, and I pay the price. Um, I, didn't, I don't have the CV that, that others do. But when I was involved in something, I was really involved in it. But I, that's, that was my decision. Um, but I started focusing my research more on methodologic issues, issues like who was consenting for genetic research in ways that were really informative, who, who was participating in research. I actually ended up ultimately writing a paper about this with Zeke Emanuel. Uh, our, our one paper together was on that. Um, um, so, so, I, also, I decided to sort of shift my research interest to in areas that I thought were more manageable as I took on more science leadership positions. And then I was recruited to go to NIH. Um, I, long story again, um, there was a, a relatively new office with a budget of like 23 million a year or so to help promote behavioral and social science research across the 27 institutes and centers. I thought this is really interesting. Again, lots of different types of research I can get involved in. And, and one of, there are friends who told me, oh, you're just going to hate it. You're a control freak. You're really going to hate this because you don't have much control there. And that's why I took the job. I wanted to see what it was like to have a hearts and minds job, and this was a hearts and minds job. It was about convincing the 27 institutes and centers to do more behavioral and social science research. And, 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 and it, it was a great experience, actually. And it was a great experience primarily because of this person. There's a book, Always There, The Remarkable Life of Ruth Lillian Kirstein. Um, she was the deputy director of NIH. She was the first woman uh, to run an institute there. She was a pioneering polio researcher. And between the Clinton and the Bush administrations, she was for a long time the acting director of the agency. So she was hiring, she hired me. And she was great. Um, I, I grew to become great uh, colleagues with her. Uh, but but she, when I first showed up, she, would, she sat me down and said, you know, we're going to be making an appointment every other week in the afternoon, and you're going to come in and talk to me, and I'm going to tell you what to do. So <laughs> it's like, you're going to float ideas by me, and I'll tell you whether those are good ideas or not. Uh, um, and we're just going to have these afternoon sessions. And she just told me this. She said, it's going to be scheduled. I know it was every week or every other week, and you're going to come in. You're going to tell me what you're going to do, and, I, and, and I'm going to tell you how NIH works. And so every other week or every week for a while, I would come in and sit down with, okay, these are the areas I'm thinking about. And she said, oh. Maybe you should do it that way. Maybe you should do it this way. And, and, and I did that for like three or four months. And then one day I came in and she said, uh, we won't be meeting anymore. <laughs> she said, you know, I think you, you get it. Sort of go. <laughs> I mean, literally, she's sort of like, we won't be meeting anymore. It's not useful for my time or your time. Um, I think you sort of get what to do. But it was a, it was a, it was a, a great lesson. Um, but she also became a fan of mine in many ways. She sort of figured out that I was really interested in scientific leadership issues. So the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism was retiring, and she literally called me up and said, I'm going to appoint you acting director. And I said, you know I don't do research on alcoholism. <laughs> I mean, you sort of, that's not, I maybe do many things, but that's not one of them. Um, not one paper. And she said, you know, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've decided, and she was very much like that. It was like, I've decided that you're going to be the acting director of the Alcohol Institute. <laughs> So why are you talking about this? Or I've decided this. Um, and it was great. So I got to run this institute while running the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research. So I had two pretty big jobs. It, and it was a small institute by NIH standards, meaning two to $300 million budget, maybe 200 staff. But it was the and is the world's primary funder of alcoholism and alcohol research. And alcoholism was great because it had a little bit of everything. It was a huge genetic research component, including in our intramural program, lots of genetics research about uh, uh, alcoholism. 
there were huge behavioral parts, they had huge uh, health services research portfolio, there was an economics part, so you had this sort of huge array of research that was funded. And, I, and, and it ended up being a great year. Um, um, and I have to thank Ruth for that experience, because um, um, I never would have considered it otherwise. And, and I did it, and it, I learned a tremendous amount, and it, it really set, I did it for a year, both of those for a year, and then I, it set me up for my next job, and that was to be the principal deputy director, her former job. Um, and um, it happened under Ilya Sirhuni, uh, who was appointed by President Bush as director of, of NIH. I spent a huge amount of time in photos like this, sitting to the, the right or left of Ilias at hearings, and actually to the left there, the person over there is, Sam, uh, is Martin Harris, who was a clinical scholar here, uh, and he is now chief information officer at, at Cleveland Clinic. You should have him come and give this talk too, a really great person. Um, um, and, and I had a, a, a great run, and I'm going to talk about the nadir and the pinnacle of that experience. So um, first, th the position was restructured to be more like a COO type position. So I really participated in the overall management, 27 institutes and centers, $30 billion, 18,000 employees, 40,000 grants. Big work. Um, but I was also director of the office of the director. Um, and that's sort of this infrastructure that runs the agency. And as deputy director, I directed that. And that was a billion dollars in budget. Just that slice was a billion um, with 2,000 employees. So, so this was a great management experience in lots of ways. I helped set up what is now the Office of Portfolio Analysis and Strategic Initiatives, where we, uh, the first real effort to do knowledge management for understanding what was in the portfolio already funded at NIH. What are the likely uh, opportunities? How you sort of plan science? Um, and, and that office has become sort of the center of that. And I helped, I, I was acting director for several years, uh, two years, deeply involved in it. So I got to do really interesting things. And unfortunately, I was also made the chief ethics officer for NIH. And that was where the problems began. Um, December 7th, uh, I think it's 2004. Um, Lee, you can't see it, a front page article in the LA Times, Stealth Merger, Drug Companies, and Government Medical Research. It was a front page article, opened up to two full pages, in which an investigative reporter demonstrated, to his credit, that a number of scientists in the intramural program at NIH had been consulting with industry in violation of federal regulation and law. After the publication of this article, for the next three years, I spent between two and 10 hours a day dealing with this. It was my Washington scandal experience. And it was a hell of a, an experience. This was a, a photo that was from the Post. I clearly don't look happy. Uh, um, I, that's John Aguanobi, who was the head of the, civil, uh, the uh, Public Health Service, the Assistant Secretary for Health, and John Niederhuber, the head of NCI, as, we are being, as we're testifying. We were investigated by the Inspector General, the, the Office of Management and Budget, two congressional oversight committees, the GAO. There was criminal prosecution. It was a complete mess. People's lives were ruined. It was a small number of people who did wrong, but it had huge implications. And it was just hell. <laughs> it was a great experience to have had. Uh, um, and I hope to never repeat that experience. But it, it, it opened up, I mean, I always feel for people now when, when I see the Washington headlines, because beneath all the scandals are real people whose lives are being, can be ripped apart. We became in the middle of a fight between the LA Times and the Washington Post over who had the strongest investigative reporting. So they would ping, there were articles written about the pinging back and forth between the, I, I was on the way to work one day, and I stopped at Connecticut Avenue on a red light and pulled out my Blackberry, which I did more than I should have, but it was, it was a red light. So I pulled it out, and I, and I got the first, an article, that, you know, the press folks would get up early and send me all the articles. And it was an article from the front page of the LA Times in which one of my personal emails with four people was leaked to the press. I mean, it was sort of one of these moments I later found out, I, I can guess who leaked it. I'm not 100% sure. And it actually made me look good. Um, but, but it was not, still not an experience that you like, because it means that it, you, nothing is, you can't, I mean, you really do have to assume everything is, is public. But, but it, horrible experience, uh, and I learned. Um, but that was followed by being acting director, which was a pretty good experience, you know. 
um, as experiences go, primarily because of ERA, the America Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. Now, I was acting director. Legally, we can't lobby Congress for money, so it, it, but we educate it um, 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 in lots of ways. Um, and, and, I, and there was all this education going on about what was a reasonable amount of money to ask for for NIH. And, you know, everything, I think at a hearing I was asked, and I said, well, you know, we could certainly handle a couple of billion. Um, that we could pretty easily do. And then these numbers started being thrown around, seven billion, then people were saying, oh, no, if you ask for too much, you'll just piss off Congress and they'll take away money. No, ask for two billion. It was sort of surreal, this conversation. And then our inspector said, mm, 10. I, my name, you will not get my vote unless $10 billion goes to NIH. Think about it. I mean, no discussion. It was sort of, and he didn't blink. And we got $10 billion. Um, and um, I had the great pleasure of helping to decide how that money was going to be spent. <laughs> and I, went to, I was f trying to find an article about this in the New York Times. And I chose the article for another reason, but I found this sentence. I thought, wow, that's interesting. Although Dr. Kington serves in acting capacity, he will have more power to distribute more money than any agency director in history. The legislation gives his office about $1 billion to distribute as he sees fits with few of the agency's usual restrictions. It was actually $800 million, actually. But, <laughs> you know, close to a billion. Um, and, and we still don't know why it happened, but it actually just said, you know, we're going to give the director this much money, and you can decide. And suffice it to say, my calendar filled up. Um, um, and, but the article, the article was primarily about uh, a session I had I, with the, at the Associated, uh, Association of American, American Association for Advancement of Science, in which all the major players in, in the biomedical world were there. I'm sure Penn had its rep there. Everyone had its rep there. And at the end of uh, the session, I was asked, someone raised it and said, well, how do we know that you're not going to use political factors to determine how the money is going to be distributed? And I said, you know, listen, we aren't going to sell our soul for $10 billion. And I should have stopped there. Um, and then, but I said next, I said, it would cost much more. Um, um, and of course, that was the last line of the New York Times uh, 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 article. Um, it would cost much more. At least they did say I added it as a joke. Um, but it was great fun. And it, it, lots of people were involved, all the institute and center directors, the leadership of the office of the director, not one misstep. I mean, literally not one accusation that money was wasted. And if you think it's easy to spend $10 billion, it actually isn't. Um, um, and it, little things, one thing I was big on was summer supplements. And like 5,000 students got summer jobs that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise out of this. So uh, that was the, the, the high point. Um, we're getting close to where I am now. Um, I was starting to get calls to be president of large research intensive universities. Um, wasn't sure what, what that was all about, whether I wanted to do that. It seemed like there weren't many of those presidents who seemed to be having fun. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, uh, and this is probably before Amy started, I mean, but she seems to be having fun. Um, and I got calls for, the, at one point, several years before, I'd gotten a courtesy interview, and it was strictly a courtesy interview to be um, the head of the Smithsonian. And, I, and it was, it, which is instantly the, the greatest job in the world. I'm, um, it's a great job. Um, and I pulled some strings and got interviewed. And the headhunter who did the interview um, remembered me. And he said, he, at the end of the interview, he said, you know, I think you could do this job, but this is, you need another job before you become head of the Smithsonian. <laughs> it was an interesting thing he said. And I remembered it. And he remembered me. So he, he was helping to do searches for a couple of liberal arts colleges and, and said, you know, I remember that you had some interesting interests, broad interests. Would you be interested? I mean, actually, liberal arts colleges are into broad. I mean, that's sort of what their thing is. Maybe you would do well in a liberal arts college. And after a lot of thought, I, I actually really grew to love this community and, and became a convert. You know, I say it's nothing worse than a convert. Um, I'm, I really believe that liberal arts colleges are an important place for many students. Not all students, but there's a subset of students who really blossom and, and, and you, in a distinctive way in this type of school. I was approached about being the president of Grinnell. Um, at the same time, right before I had gone through two interviews at O'Hare Hilton, many of you know that drill, um, the fl uh, where I've had many hours spent in the O'Hare uh, Hilton um, interviewing or being interviewed, and um, got through a series of interviews, and it was time for me to come to Iowa. I'd never been to Iowa. 
And um, uh, NIH did work with NASA. So they were having the last night launch of the space shuttle. So I got invited to go to this night launch. Um, so, I, so I went, and I brought my spouse and our kids. Our kids then were one and four. And it was the time of the, the huge snow. Uh, it was February of 2010. There was a huge snowstorm that shut down the East Coast. So we were stuck in Florida, and I had to be in Iowa in, on Wednesday. So every, every day we were saying, oh, God, how do we get there? We finally found a flight through Charlotte. Um, and we got to Charlotte, and we found out that they hadn't, in fact, opened uh, uh, Dulles, so we, we couldn't go there. And the next day was my interview. Someone at the, at the school found a flight from Charlotte to Des Moines and said, why don't you just put your whole family on the flight and come to Des Moines? So we came to Des Moines, landed at 9 o'clock at night. It was uh, 9 degrees. We were in Florida clothing, <laughs> and they had lost our luggage. So we had... So I dropped the family off. Then I went to Walmart. <laughs> and I spent probably $400 on formula and bottles and pajamas and an outfit to interview in. <laughs> and so I tell people, if you truly want to prepare for anything, just drop by your local Walmart, because often that's the only place that's open at midnight in the middle of nowhere when you have to get clothing and you don't have your clothing. And it's happened to me twice. <laughs> um, so I, I, polyester pants, deep pleats, uh, you know, <laughs> short sleeve, white cotton, polyester blend shirt, synthetic wool that beaded up after the first wool and wash. I keep that outfit in my um, closet, in my office. I was interviewed twice in it because I had to stay for the next day and interviewed in it. And to the board's credit, they decided to not judge me by my clothing, um, and instead judged me by my mind, and, and I came to Iowa. Um, I've still continued to do opportunistic research. I did work on racial and ethnic differences in NIH research awards. Long story about how that came to be. Probably the, uh, by far the paper that has gotten the most press came out in science. It created lots of discussion. Um, I'm going to close up on a few slides. One, these are my mentors. That's the list of mentors. And they're all over the map, um, from, from Jordan to Sam to Patricia, Bob, Walter Allen, Jim Smith, Ruth Hirstein, Ilias Sahuni. By far the most brilliant strategic thinker I've ever encountered, Ilias. Truly amazing. Um, mentors, it's not always obvious who the best mentor will be. They could be really anywhere. You never know. Um, it, but one thing you can be sure of, if, you're in, if your mentor only cares about recreating herself or himself, then you need to run fast, um, because that's not a good mentor. And it, you'd be surprised how many people are incapable of thinking of a trajectory other than the trajectory that they took. Consider a composite mentor. I often had multiple mentors, each focusing on a different, because there was no single person who had done what I did. Um, so, it, so for me, that worked. And you know, your mentor doesn't have to look like you. Perhaps obvious, but, but true. Um, building a family, this is my spouse. I was the head of the child psychiatry training program at the University of Iowa. And our two sons, Emerson and Basile, um, great kids. We had a family um, in my 40s, a little bit late. But it occurred to me that, you know, there's never a convenient time to have a family. It just isn't. Um, families are inconvenient in lots of ways. <laughs> um, 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 but, but, but important um, for me, it was important. Um, so we had. Uh, a family, and, and, but, but I have to tell you, it's, it's not an easy thing having young kids being college president. Um, but, but I have to admit that we also, in many ways, we have it very easy in some ways. So, so we, it's a great place to raise kids, actually, a small town with a great college and lots of fields. And so, so it's good, uh, but it's, 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 it's a, it, you know, there's a reason why you don't see a lot of college presidents with young kids. Um, um, in terms of being other, I'm always other. I, all of my life, I've been other. Um, um, when I was appointed president of Grinnell, there was a whole series of articles about, you know, you know first gay president of blah, blah, blah. And a friend of mine started referring to me as the, the black gay dead college president, sort of hyphenated, <laughs> that that's what I was. Um, and I'd never sort of seen anything like that, but they took this whole life of its own online. It sort of was odd. But I think there is a value to being other. When you learn to see yourself as others see you, you better learn it pretty quick <laughs> because it's important. You learn to bridge different worlds. 
Um, and you, you, you become accustomed to not assuming that everyone sees the world as you do. And these are all good skills, and this is my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> this, this is it. Um, so um, thoughts on leadership. You know, learning leadership isn't linear. Rarely is. It's hard to plan. Uh, greatest learning experiences will often be in totally unexpected areas. Um, there's an interesting book. The title I like. The book is so-so, but the title is great. What got you here won't get you there. Often the skills that will get you up aren't necessarily the skills that you need once you get there. And it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> and I'm still learning. Um, so I have room for growth on that one. Um, um, and managing yourself is the single most difficult challenge. It, it really is. I mean, it, you know, it's how you react to the world that determines your success. And I, I'm a work in progress on that front. I will readily acknowledge. Behavioral change is hard, especially when it's self-directed. Um, but, but, but this really is the most difficult challenge. It's sort of learning not to say something, <laughs> you know, which you know, can be a challenge for some of us. Um, general career advice, it never stop learning. Push the boundaries of your knowledge and skills. Don't assume anything about where your career will lead. I, I came back in December. I was, got an honorary doctorate at Michigan and was the commencement speaker at the, Mich the mid-year commencement. It was at Michigan. It's huge. It's like 5,000 people. Um, and I said, you know, I never in a, it would have been inconceivable for me to think about that I would be where I was, you know, when I was leaving Michigan. I just, it, it, it was inconceivable. So you just never know. Um, and if there's any lesson in my career, it's to keep an open mind. Um, and this is also an important lesson. You know, winning is easy. Sort of rebounding from a stumble is hard, and you're going to stumble. We all do, and it's a really hard skill. And I've managed thus far to be relatively good at rebounding from stumbles. Um, I've had them, um, but, but I've always benefited from my stumbling, and, and I know that that's hard. Every step requires new skills. And it often isn't hard, isn't easy to find who, get the right people to tell you what those new skills are, let alone how to acquire them. Um, so you have to learn, again, how to manage yourself and find guidance in lots of different places. And I can talk to more about that. So where do I go from here? You know, I'm not really sure. I, I'm still sort of at the intersection of these worlds. Um, relatively satisfied. So I'll stop there. Open up the <laughs> Questions, thoughts? So your career seemed to cover a very sort of broad range. Uh -huh. And uh, as faculty typically start their career or mature their career in medicine, typically the key critical components stay focused. Mm -hmm. So how do you sort of like, are almost like the opposite of that? <laughs> yeah, so unfocused. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard. I mean, it's, it, you know, and I, I sort of constantly struggle with whether I would advise people to do what I did. <laughs> Um, it turned out okay, but it, it, it could very well not have turned out okay. But I was willing to fail and uh, heading toward what I thought was right for me. Um, I actually think, and I really do believe this, that in the future there will be more people like me in terms of their careers because of the barriers to knowledge that are dropping. And I think there are more opportunities for people to follow their interests in nonlinear ways um, and there'll be more and more people who cut across and did what I did, but, but, but who, didn't, who couldn't like move their lives to another state and you know, go to a school and I mean, who do it by, by online learning in particular. Um, so I think there'll be more people and I think that will be great because I think there'll be people who think about careers that have never been thought about and ways to connect knowledge over here with knowledge over there that we haven't even thought, uh, dreamed of. Um, so I actually think the future is, is away from narrow deep. And there will always be a need for narrow deep, but I think that will be complemented more and more by the sort of T part of the T, the top part of the T, rather than the stem part of the T. Um, um, but but we're, we're not there. Um, and there will still, it, it will, it, for the foreseeable future, it will still be riskier. And there were people who told me, be narrow, and then when you get to a certain part, then you can expand. But you have to be able to tell a story, too. You have to be able to explain sort of your, your, yourself um, and make the connections. Because often, that's what will make the, win the day, is whether you're able to tell a compelling sort of story of the trajectory and why it makes sense to you. Um, um, and sometimes that requires being creative. 
if, if, if the answer really is because I'm just interested in this lots of different stuff, which is sort of my answer, but I, could, I didn't give that answer much. <laughs> I, I gave a more compelling answer because there often was a sort of a reason why I thought through the connections and the trajectories. Yes? Fantastic presentation and really amazing career. And now you are president. So what are two or three challenges that you are facing and what are you doing about it? Um, every president in America is thinking about their financial model. So Grinnell is very fortunate in that we have a large endowment. We had the great fortune of having Warren Buffett on our board for 20 years before he became Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. um, and we had, so we have an endowment that we have a million dollars for student endowment. Um, so that's great. But we do, we have really bad record for raising money and for net tuition revenue, and we've become the go-to place for really smart kids who know that they want financial aid and they have huge need. So our discount rate, tuition discount rate is over 60%. There's only one institution in America with higher discount rate is Harvard, with their 30 plus billion endowment. So, so for us, the financial model is a real issue. Trying to think about how we can best prepare students for the future in terms of learning, um, particularly how to integrate technology. Many in academia are terrified of what's happening with MOOCs and, to, I mean, feel that it's all a plot to get rid of faculty. I mean, sort of, especially at the undergraduate level. And, and I actually don't believe that. I actually think, if anything, it, can, it, it will complement the, the room experience and maybe even heighten and make it even more valuable. Um, but, but there's great anxiety in the academy about that. Um, I'm dealing also with the issue of how do you deal with the blurring lines across disciplines when you still have a tenure system that's very discipline-based. So we're starting to move in the direction of dealing with that. Um, yeah, so, so those are some of the challenges um, that uh, we're dealing with. I don't have an answer to them. Um, I haven't gotten a vote of no confidence yet from the faculty, so, <laughs> but give me time. <laughs> Others? Yes. Thank you for sharing. You definitely had an incredible trajectory in history. Um, and certainly of yourself are kind of a bundle of diversity in so many ways, all in one, in terms of your career and personal experience and background. So I'm curious to know what, what you found as successful ways to ensure that after you've left these places, there are sustainable paths for other diverse uh, audiences to come through. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be racial and ethnic diversity. Yeah. I mean, types of students, socioeconomic economic yeah. background. Um, what have you found as successful ways to Keep that, keep that happening. Well, I don't have a magic answer. That's the, the, the issue that every institution in America is trying to deal with. Because you know, I pointed out that you know, last year, I believe last year was the first year in which the majority of births in the United States were non-white. So that means 18 years from now, that's who going, who's going to be graduating from high school. And many of our institutions, especially the highly selective institutions, are woefully unprepared for that demographic shift. Um, in all sorts of ways. I think there are lots of institutions that say, oh, we'll just, we'll just skim the cream a little bit more. You know, we'll be just fine. Well, everyone's saying that. <laughs> you know, it can't all be right. Um, 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 so it's a challenge, and I don't know what the right answer is. Um, we've been trying to do things like um, develop innovative programs to, to help students succeed. Um, I think one great challenge, you know, much in diversity in higher ed, most, almost all the discussion has been about two things. Who gets in the door and who graduates? And I, I believe deeply that we have to shift the conversation to what happens between, because there are huge performance gaps across demographic groups, and, you know, huge ones, and, and, and the likelihood of getting an A or likelihood of getting an F. And I mean, there's big differences that we haven't really explained, and we haven't tried to develop interventions to deal with. It's almost as if people think it's like written in stone, that that's the way it's always going to be. Um, so I think that's the next big frontier, sort of to deal with the performance gap. Um, but many people r really don't want to talk about it um, because they believe that it will be used as an argument against diversity. Um, I actually don't agree with that. We will never deal with this unless we actually see what the situation is and then develop interventions and think about how we can. It, that is not destiny. That's not inevitable. And there are places. UMBC, uh, Freeman Robowski's program, has done incredible things. I mean, so there are places that have been able to do that, change that trajectory in all sorts of ways. Um, it, but it, it's, it's hard. I mean, you know, it's the hardest thing that I have to deal with. <laughs>
is sort of try to, to deal with sustainable change in terms of opportunity. Um, and it's e the more elite the institution, the harder it is, the harder the conversation is. So I don't have an answer. I've tried everywhere I go to sort of, it sort of, to sort of bring a perspective of, of that really believes that, I mean, if we don't deal with some of these diversity issues, we won't fill our seats. We won't exist and the country won't accept. I mean, and we don't have that level of deep buying into the problem that we need to have. And so, you know, if, if, if I were to, and, and there are people who are working, I think the Gates Foundation is doing great work to try to really deal with some of the tough issues. I don't always agree with where they end up, but, but they're trying to struggle with it. And, and I don't know what the answer is. You have to do the best you can, everywhere you can, recognizing that you can't do everything. Um, and one of the challenges I've had, I certainly had at NIH, was to sort of help the community come to terms with the realization that in spite of 30 years of programs for diversity at NIH, we never had more than 2% of the PIs African-American, in spite of 30 years of programs. In my mind, that means the programs aren't working. Not everyone agrees with that interpretation. There are people who, who say no, they've done lots of things. But, but it, 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 it was a hard conversation for the community to have in lots of ways. And, and so I, I believe that, you know, that you'll never get anywhere if you don't have these hard conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but, but man, a smart person doesn't have them. <laughs> Someone who cares about their career trajectory doesn't have these. Um, because they're, you know, the risk of just having it explode in your face is everywhere. But I really deeply believe that if you don't have the conversation, you know, 50 years from now we'll still be having the same conversation about change and we can't afford that. So. I know there's uh, other questions and we could keep going on, but I think we're going to have to uh, close and, and just, um, just want to personally thank you for sharing uh, uh, your story uh, on behalf of uh, School of Medicine and Wharton and everyone here is really quite remarkable. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure.